Hi, um, I'm Pamela Blanc, and I'm here at Bamberger Ranch in Johnson City with J. David Bamberger. And we're going to be talking about my book, My Stories All True, J. David Bamberger on Life as an Entrepreneur and Conservationist. And I think I'll say hi, David. Hey, hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get with it. David is going to be 92 in five weeks, he just told no, me. I'm going to be 93. I'm yeah. sorry, 93. Thank you so much. I got that wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about how David and I know each other, and then I'm going to ask him some questions. And at the end of the session, you'll have some time to ask us questions as well. So Jay, David, and I actually met each other maybe 12 years ago. I was a staff writer for the Austin American Statesman in Austin, where I worked for 21 years. And I had an assignment to come out to the ranch to meet David and write about a conservation award that he had received. So I came out to the ranch and uh, David was in his 80s then, his early 80s, I believe. And he was out here with a group of environmentalists and he was showing them some work that he had done around the ranch. So David was running up and down these hillsides showing these conservationists some um, perched aquifers that he had created on the hillside to help conserve water here. And half the people in the group could barely keep up with David because he was running up and down the hill so much. And he was, he reminded me of a, a tent revival preacher man at the time saying, I can't remember the words he used, but it was like he was preaching to the, his audience. And um, David, as you'll find out in a few minutes is very, enthusiastic and spirited guy um, and after that after I, I went around the ranch with him that day he invited me up to his ranch house and when I was at the ranch house I noticed that there were lots of Indian or Native American artifacts around his home and I saw on one windowsill he must have had several hundred projectile points and little arrowheads and since I was a little kid, I have always dreamed of finding an arrowhead in the dirt somewhere. And I spent hours as a kid kind of hiking around and never once did I find one. And David told me that he had found all these artifacts on his property. And so I think he saw my eyes light up probably and um, realized that I, that was something that I really wanted to do. I wanted to go look for arrowheads. So. He invited me to come out and a few months later I managed to come out to his property and we I came out several times after that and during the course of those visits David started telling me all these great stories and he's told me stories about his childhood growing up in a small town in Ohio and then from there David went on to become a door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman and from there he went on to be one of the founders of the church's fried chicken um, chain of restaurants. And when he was fairly young, he decided that he was done with the fried chicken business and he wanted to get to his life's work. And his life's work was bringing land back to health, I guess you would say. So as David kept telling me these stories of his life, I had a feeling in the back of my mind that he wanted to write those stories down. And eventually David, asked me to help him do that. And so we spent a couple of years and David told me all these stories and uh, we turned it into a book. And so I'm gonna, <laughs> here's the book. <laughs> um, I wanna start by asking David, uh, people ask him this all the time. He started out as a vacuum cleaner salesman, but then he eventually became a high powered entrepreneur um, with a very popular fried chicken business. So David, what did you learn as a door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman that helped you in the fried chicken business? Well, thank you, Pam. <laughs> Nobody would believe it, so I'm glad you put all true on the book. But if you think about this, the door-to-door -door salesman, nobody wants that as a job. It's the employment of the last resort, really. Yeah. But what's missing in the restaurant business today that was coming on very strong back then. And that is the inability of the restaurants to hire and to hold on people. And in the door-to-door -door business, as I went through that, I became a distributor down there in San Antonio. I had as many as 54 men and women working for me. Yeah. And I thought, my gosh, and that was straight commission. They didn't get a penny. 
And when the fried chicken opportunity came up, one of my salespeople was Bill Church. He was the son of the, of the founder. They only had a few stores. And I wrote a book back then that said the coming boom in franchising. But the key to all of the restaurants, all of them that I had, and we had over 1,400 when we sold it out, is people to operate them. And that's the tough one, and it remains that today. It's still a problem with all restaurants. If you go into any fast food restaurant in particular, you'll find help in there that are still uh, maybe 75, 80 years old. And you'll find young people, you'll find them black and white and brown and any color because there's nobody wants to say to the university or to the high school, hey, Percher, get me out of there. I want to go to work at Jack in the Box. No, they want education so they don't have to go to work at Jack in the Box. And I discovered that now the opportunity was there, deluxe. I can now interview and hire somebody and I can pay them. Yeah. In the door to door game, you don't pay them anything if they don't sell one. <laughs> so I'm proud to tell you this 21 millionaires came out of that, that company that I helped motivate. And 100% of them, there wasn't one in there with a college education. About half of them perhaps might have had a high school education, but most of them were even less than that. And I started a program, even the board of directors of the company didn't believe me. But the theme of it is we're going to make big people out of little people. And you start teaching them how to clean their fingernails because if it was a young man, he had to use a jumper cable every morning to get things started. Then you taught him how to tie a necktie, and I supplied the neckties. They never wore neckties in their life. And I'm telling you what, hiring people was duck soup for me, and everybody else was crying about it. So the answer to your question basically is, it isn't, it, it isn't, that they're going to work in an air conditioned office. What they're doing, you're, you're teaching them from the very beginning that you're going to make, help make something out of them that they aspire to. Now, Pam, I want to tell you something. I was born into poverty. And when I learned to shave, one day I just was using the shaver and a shaving curl and I put a on the mirror I put a dollar sign now one day my mom come in there says Davy what are you what are you writing on this sign and I said mom when I grow up I don't want to be this damn poor hmm. and that dollar sign <laughs> etched into her mirror <laughs> I don't know what she ever did with it, but she didn't care for that too much. So I'm only going to say that to move from a door to door sweeper business. And in, in that movement, I spent about of the 17 years, I spent about 10 of it actually doing this work. And the last seven was hiring people to come in. And I learned to teach them to sing a song. We sang songs every morning. And I had a, had so much success making big people out of little people. So you had a lot of success in the fried chicken business, but that wasn't necessarily what you consider your life's work. Oh, Even yeah. when you were successful there, at a certain point, you wanted to get out and do what was super important to you, which was restore the land. Why is that so important to well, you? Well, uh, you got it partially right, Pam. <laughs> You're not going to build a fried chicken chain that's doing them <laughs> millions of dollars worth of sales every day. You're not going to do that unless you have some kind of a starting. You had to collect some money. You had to learn to hold on to your money instead of blowing it on something. Too many people 
run out and buy a new car when they start to make a little bit of money. Right. And my the thing that I taught the men and women that I brought into that business was you're going to make some pretty good money, but you got to learn how to hold on to it. Don't run out and spend it. And that's what I didn't do. And so I accumulated enough capital. Let me tell you the rest of that story. One day after we were even a public company, our financial officer come in to see Bill Church. He was a head man and I was number two. And he wanted to know, he looked up, he said, Bill, how did Bamberger get all this stock? Boy, he was up in the air because I had about 20 times more than he did. And Bill looked at him with a big grin because Bill always carried a big smile on his face. And he said, well, Vernon, you're the chief financial officer here. You ought to know that. <laughs> Vernon says, well, I don't. And Bill says, well, I'll tell you, he's the only one of us that had any money. And the starting money came from me, not from That's the rest. Right. That's right. Because they had squandered their money. Yeah. And so easy. It's so easy because every time you watch a television, every time you pick up a magazine or newspaper, somebody's advertising something. And right here on the ranch that we're sitting today, I see these young people falling prey to something that's advertised. And then I see the same damn thing they bought within a year's time or less. I see it being a thrown into the dump. Well, don't fall prey to every little temptation that comes your way. And that was part of my basic belief as a young man. But so what you've talked a lot about a book that you read that your mother gave you when you were a child. And that book had a lot of influence on what you wanted to do here at Bamberger Ranch. Yes. And that book, the title was of the book was The Coming Boom in Franchising. Well, I'm thinking about the book about the Bromfield book. Oh, my goodness sakes, yes. So I want to talk about the ranch. Right? I'm, I'm, we're sitting in David's workshop at the ranch, and we're looking out a window, and all I can see are beautiful hills and trees and no, no houses or buildings. And one of the things that Mr. Bamberger did when he was successful with Church's Fried Chicken was seek out what he thought was the most abused piece of land in the hill country. Tell them how you found this ranch land here and why you chose it? Well, the book that my mother gave me when I was a teenager uh, had to do with land management. Uh, and a, a world-known author by the name of Lewis Bromfield had written this book. And what he was, he was a, a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist and he, he lived in France for a big part of his life. And World War II breaks out, and they say, Lewis, you better get out of here. This war is going to get pretty bad. But all the time that Lewis Bromfield spent in, in Europe, as he marveled at the way the European people on little acre tracks sometimes, how they treated the land and how they could make it and keep it productive year after year without using a bunch of commercial fertilizers and that sort of thing. So when he got out of there just before World War II broke out, he sailed and he got out in, in New York and he got an automobile and he drove to the hills of Ohio, which was just 35 miles from my mom's home. And uh, in his book, he purposely, well, he went there and he looked for the land that his grandparents had where he worked on as a young man only to find it an abandoned piece of real estate. It was, it was overworked, it was unproductive, it was grown up with briars and brush, and it was just not anything. So he purchases that, that track of land and two other neighboring tracks, and, in, and in, then went into 
a program to see if he could take this worn out real estate that nobody wanted. And you know what? You get something that nobody else wants. You know, it's pretty cheap. It's cheap. <laughs> so you can buy a lot of land for a few dollars. He got in touch with a university extension, Ohio State, and he said he needed a couple of young people to help him work this idea, this concept. And he brought, they sent people down and he talked to them and he ended up hiring two, one of them which stayed with him till forever. And he went through and kept good records on everything he did. And that book that my mom gave me, she I went over there and she drove, drove me over there. And she became a friend of Lewis Brownfield, and I, I watched and everything. It, it was an inspiration to yeah. me. So in 1969, you purchased this land here. And why did you find, how did you find this land? What did it, it was, you were looking for something. You were looking for a piece of land that you could restore just as he had done. That's quite true. What was this land like at the time? Hey, listen, you won't believe it. It was about the lousiest piece of real estate in Blanco County. Nobody wanted it. It was grown up with wall to wall, cedar, all kinds of brush. And there wasn't any water. There wasn't much grass to speak of. It, had, it was just in terrible shape. And what did you do to help bring it back? Because now I look out and it's very green. You have springs, you have water enough to support several families who live on this ranch. I just want to tell you something, Pam. We didn't have any water. And I drilled seven water wells, 500 foot deep. And I never got a damn drop of water. Wow. wow. So what do you do to get water? Under these hills, there's, uh, there's different kind of uh, soils and there's different kind of stones and rocks and if you look out there on those hillsides if you went up there and tried to dig a hole for a plant a tree or something <laughs> you're not going to get it done it's all solid rock and under right under the surface is more stone so what you had to do you had to pick out low places or places on the land and then you had to get in there by hand and cut the underbrush out and after you got that out of the way then you could uh, scarify that a little bit more and you could by using native grass seeds you could spread it over those areas so what is it about grass that helps the, the, grass, the water come back the root system of grass allows rainfall when it comes down if you've got that grass and the grass it will go deeper into the soil than the roots of a tree. Wow. And now then when you have rainfall falling on these spots, sometimes ours was no bigger than a tennis court. But then you jump over here a quarter of a mile and maybe you get something as big as a football field. Okay. And as the years go on, those plots will spread seed from it and they'll reach out and, and be your partner. So we know that native grasses are really important to restoring land in the Texas Hill Country, but you've also, um, w one of the things that people connect with you is this idea that we need to remove a lot of the ash juniper or cedar trees from land. But tell us more about that, because I know that you don't necessarily want to remove all of the ash juniper. There's, no. tell us, well, more. I don't believe in, in, in cutting out all of the cedar. It's a native tree in itself, but due to overgrazing, primarily with sheep and goats and horses and cattle, because people have put too much on. And with the introduction of fencing on top of that, and now the war comes along, World War One and World War Two as well, and the federal government came in and said, boys, Raise some beef for right. the war effort. We need we need all the meat we can have. So what did these cowboys do? They put more cattle, goats, sheep, whatever, on the land than the land would support. They ate the grass right back down to the dirt yeah. again. 
and this reverse what they'd spent years getting ready. So I eliminated livestock and let the grasses grow. And within less than three years, the first spring began to bubble. Wow. And we saw on the side of one of these hills, Pam, we saw green spots. It was August. What the hell? Wow. There's got to be some moisture. We climb up those hills and all the ground, it's all damp. We come back the next day with picks and shovels and crowbars. And we crowbar into it and we ended up getting some of them two and three foot deep. We come back the next day and it's full of crystal clear spring water. Wow, that's amazing. So now I know you guys also did a bird count back early in the early days of the ranch and there weren't many species of birds and there weren't many other animals here, but that has changed as well, right? Oh my gosh. Well, I've, uh, I don't, I didn't join, I'm not a joiner, but I'm a fellow traveler of, not just in politics, but I'm a fellow traveler of people that before me has spent a lot of time trying to learn about things. And so we have the Audubon people from San Antonio and from Austin, and they came out and helped us do a bird counts, which I kept records of. And they came out four times a year, spring and fall and winter and everything. And on a year round basis, they found only, I think it was 46, perhaps 48 different species of bird. Here's what's neat about all of this. As, as we kept developing more plats and getting some of our pastures up, as a corollary, I can show you how every year, as we got better with the land, the bird counts. Do you know what our bird count was last fall? You told me and I forgot. 218. That's a lot. That's how many birds from this 48. That's amazing. And all of that, that's not because we fed the birds. That's because the land fed the birds. So, David, you're also somewhat fav famous for bringing bats to this land. Tell us about your bat cave that you built. Oh, <laughs> I'll tell you. Somebody invited me, and I met a, a, a doctor. Uh, what was his name? Anyway, he started the Bat Conservation International. Marlon Tuttle. Marlon Tuttle. Thank yeah. you. That's who it was. <laughs> So he invites me to see a bat emergence. I said, bat emergence? Man, I don't like bats at all. He said, you might after you come with me. So he invites me and I go and I'm witnessing. And it was down at a bat cave down around out east of San Antonio. This is Bracken? Bracken Cave. Okay. And when I saw that, I couldn't believe it. 20 million bats pouring out of a hole in the ground. My God, it was so spectacular. And I stayed with Merlin Tuttle and joined his board of directors and I learned more and more and more about bats and everything. And I said, I said, I, I gotta have something like that on because I wanted this ranch to represent all part of mother nature. Sure. And bats are good because they eat mosquitoes. Oh, well, some of them do and some don't. And, so, and they eat insects that, that yeah, harm crops as insects. well. Yep. So I asked him and others, do you think I could build a cave? Most people thought I was loony to them. Well. But Merlin and a couple of other scientists said, no reason why you can't. So I got a little help. And we selected the part on the ranch that met a criteria that they had experience in, the direction it pointed, the openness and such and such. And we actually constructed a cave. And it took four years to, before bats finally, finally found it. In the meantime, a reporter from, I, whenever we got the thing built, I invited, I, Blood for publicity, I invited every newspaper, TV station, and everybody to come. And we had a big 
grand opening yeah. of this day. And so, but here's year one, year two, year three. Not a bat. And I get this phone call from the reporter from the San Antonio Express News, and he's still at Press News today. <laughs> And he said, I'm doing a, a follow-up on that uh, story we wrote about you four years ago. How many bats do you have? Well, I said, I can't, I can't count them, but I can tell you this. They cost me $500 each. He said, ha, you don't have any bats, and I'm going to write it up. And believe it or not, so help me this happen. I think God's always looked down on me. It comes out in a Sunday newspaper. And they call me, uh, they got a name for me, Bat Boy or something. And he said, this guy spent more money building the house for bats than he did on his own home. Oh, my gosh. And he don't have any. Well, here's the rest of that story. <laughs> he, he asked me on the phone on a Friday. He put, published his story on a Sunday. And... But I had a student here from Austin College that was an intern for the summer. And he was going to go home the next day. And I said, I forgot his first name now, but let's, let's don't go. Let's don't go for a swim this year. Let's go up and just have a look, just in case some bats. Yeah. We went up there and that cave was, bats was pouring out of it, just pouring out. So crazy. Tears just rolling down my face. My wife was back in the East Coast on some kind of a bird meeting. And so I called a friend of mine at the, I don't know what TV station it was, but anyway, I'd always helped him by taking him to Bracken Cave. And he used bats as part of his weather forecast. He says, I said, well, it's time you do me a favor. What is it? I told him he runs a mobile unit up here. And he is transforming on Sunday night. All these bats coming out, That's probably sweet. 10 or 15,000. And the, the, the guy's story is in the Express News on Sunday night. On Monday, 5 o'clock news, here's Bamberger's Bat Cave, and it's a big success ever gone. And the next day, that guy calls me, Bamberger, you... And you mouse trapped me. You mouse my pandemic. My editor's got me coming in. I'm going to lose my job. I said, Oh, you jumped the gun. No, I didn't jump the gun. You did. That's so funny. I love that story. <laughs> well, one of the, before I go to questions and answers from the audience, um, I think one of the things that people always want to know from Mr. Bamberger is I don't have a big ranch at home, but I do have a small piece of property. What are some tips that you can give smaller landowners about how they can preserve and restore their own land? Or what if they want to plant native grasses at home? What can they do? What can we do as individual smaller landowners instead of ranch owners to help the environment with our land? You know what, Pam? It isn't any different if you got 5,000 acres or five acres. The land is going to respond to good care. And if you only had a small track of land, number one, you don't need a damn bulldozer. You don't need a tractor either. All you need is some hand tools. And then depending on what the brush is, you get out there and you work on it. You don't have to do the whole thing the first year. You just look, take a look and see what you got. Get, you get to get the material that's already out there there's plenty of books and magazines and so on and you can it'll give you direction on what to do but you don't have to do the if you only got five acres you don't even need to do an acre a year if you if you have the physical stamina and you don't need to go out and hire people to do every damn thing if you got that kind of money you ought to have five thousand acres so i've heard you suggest to people that you know, we, we need more native grass seed, but you don't necessarily even have to go to the, the nursery to get grass seed. What's your tip for, for well, getting those I, native I've seeds? I've got the best one you ever heard. You get your girlfriend or your boyfriend, whichever it is, you get a bunch of grocery bags and you head to the hill country of Texas. 
and you stay off the highways, you want to get on those dirty, dusty roads that go through the hill country. And between that road, there'll be about 50 feet, and then the rancher's got a fence. You park that damn car, and you take it out, and you go out there, and the grasses are growing. There's no cattle on it, no sheep, no goats, no horses on it. And you just grab the grass and pick it up like that and drop the seeds into the bag. You can pick, and I am not stretching it, you can pick a couple hundred dollars worth of grass in one Sunday afternoon. So does anyone care? Like, have you ever gotten his, the, the police? The only one I had, I had two people here on a workshop about a year later, and they had bumped into one another, <laughs> and they, they standing there with the bag said, did you take Bamberger's cars? <laughs> That's so yeah, funny. we did. Said, well, I'll be damned. This is my territory. You can have that. That's so funny. I love that. Yeah. Um, well, we're at about, we've got about 15 minutes left. And so I can keep asking David questions, but I wanted to know if anyone in the audience had a question for Mr. Bamberger. Nobody's listening to us. <laughs> we'll have to preach to them. Okay, well, we we can go on. Um, I wanted to tell the audience a little bit about my favorite place here on the ranch, which is called Madrone Lake. Madrone Lake is a small lake. Um, when I was out here working on the book, I would get up every morning and run to the lake, which was about a mile and a half from where I was staying. Then I would jump in the lake and swim, and then I would run back to the house and work on the book. But tell me how you planted cedar or cypress trees around that lake, David. See, that's an unbelievable story. When I got started on this, I knew I needed help but I didn't have any money to speak of to pay for help. Besides that, I wanted to wear myself thin. I wanted to feel everything. So I had this young man, his name is Jim Rose, and he had a degree from Texas A&M in uh, forestry and, and trees, as that was his given. And he showed up one Sunday and he had two pickled, five-gallon pickle buckets. I used to get those because I was in the restaurant bit. I'd get all them I wanted for free. Yeah. You go to Home Depot, it cost you $5 a bucket. So he showed up, and he was standing in my driveway with these two buckets, and he said, Dave, how'd you like to plant 5,000 trees today? That sounds like a big job. And I said, Jim, what are you smoking? <laughs> because... You can't plant 5,000 trees. He said, well, I waited in the Brackenridge Park in the creek that comes through there. And if you, you'll see the same thing in the hill country. When you get down in a creek and there are cypress trees, they'll be all growing and it was almost like a tunnel. Yeah. And he said, I got in there with these buckets. And all of these cypress trees for years after years have been dropping their seeds in the water and the water rolls around the next thing you know they get waterlogged and he said i reached down there with my hands and filled these two buckets out of this black stinking muck yeah and he said i'll promise you there's at least five thousand seeds here so you heaved it in the lake we went down to the lake as you've seen it and we set the buckets down and put our hands in there and we threw that muck out on the water, splash. And we went the whole way down the line. When that muck hit the water, it released some of those seeds that had been laying in the bottom for a long time. It was a very short period of time. I'm not talking about a year, I'm talking about months. But over 125 wow. cypress trees came up. I love those trees. Those are beautiful. They we have are. a couple of questions. Um, hold on. Chris, uh, I can't read that top one because I can't scroll. Um, can you read it? Yeah, read it for me. Hey, David. I'm Gary Graham from Days Long Ago. Days of Planted uh, Texas and Landowner Incentive Program. Looking great for a man of many years. Oh. I think it's more of a <laughs> oh, okay. All this right. Question. And then another question, what is your big next big adventure? And I'm not sure if that's for me or for David, but my next big adventure, I've got a whole calendar full of big adventures. I just got back from a ski trip. I'm writing about uh, outdoor 
travel and adventure. I'm going to Bentonville, Arkansas on Monday to do a story about mountain biking for Texas Monthly Magazine. Then I'm off to Galveston on a birding story. Then I'm off to Colorado to pick up a camper van. I've got a whole series of adventures coming up in the next year. Um, okay, David, tell sure. listeners about the challenges of working with endangered species in those early days when protests by landowners to take back Texas were focused on endangered species. Yes, I, uh, I found myself in the middle of the controversy. And uh, I actually had from my youth on, my mom taught me about birds and all the mammals and the different things that, that we have. But when the Endangered Species Act got passed, the first thing that was noted, it was the uh, spotted owl out in the West Coast. And the ranchers and farmers up that way had a real struggle. They they thought the Endangered Species Act was the government's attempt to take over their land. And I couldn't believe, I went to a public meeting over in Dripping Springs. And this young woman who was employed by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, she was facing a crowd of 75, at least 75 people. The 75 people were not kids. They were adults, sometimes 75 years old, but all of them, damn sure, over 30. And they treated this young woman so horrible that I, I felt so bad. I'm going to tell you, it was so bad, I went outside and threw up. And from that day on, I said, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to fight. I'm going to convince people by actions that you know, a motto of mine was like, I adapted it from Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson said, ask me not about my religion, let my life reflect it. And I applied that philosophy to what I was doing out here. By that time, things were really progressing. And so it isn't just me mouthing off, come on out and sh I'll show you. And I was literally un inundated with people. But strangely enough, I wasn't inundated by the people that were madder than hell and just causing the trouble. But I was inundated by the younger people that realized that there was a duty to land ownership. And what happened to the old timers, the granddaughters and the grandsons, they worked so hard, sent them off to school, and they come back and said, Grandpa, you're wrong about this. Yeah. And I watched that, it's like I just watched it happening. And it was so pleasant. And the next thing I know, I built the center building. You've seen it, Pam. Yes. And it'll sleep, it'll sleep 48 people. But what happened, I opened that free of charge to any organization or group that wanted to come out here and, and witness this. And it's like a miracle. I wasn't charging money at the time. It got so big, eventually we had to because I didn't have people to clean up and everything. Well, I think a lot of people might want to know about how they can learn are you still offering workshops or oh, yes. places that people can come learn? The young people that are here now, uh, you can check our, they have a website and uh, it gives a listing of all the different things that's available in workshops. Now the pandemic has had a, a negative impact on what they do, but they're still doing things. Big time. It's very. I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of them. And we just have a few minutes left, but there's also some research going on at the Margaret Bamberger uh, Education Center here as well. Well, we. I had the idea first of all, and I couldn't sell it to the universities because I knew that if if we did this, I wanted to see what effect ownership in the ranching community and the things that I've been preaching and teaching, uh, what could this, what could this 
amount to as far as climate change were concerned. So I went to the different universities and we have a young man here today that has done a better job of it than I have. And he has seven universities helping him right here. And so he came to me and he said, Mr. B, it isn't, you don't need to keep a deer and a, most all the different animals. The answer to, the, to this is in insects. And he said, the reason the university systems haven't been able to help you very much because they don't have room to store the collections. But, you know, we can collect 50,000 insects. And he asked me, he said, you know how many insects there are? A lot. I said, hell, I don't know. He says, well, they already know it's over 100,000, and but some of them are thinking trillion. Wow. They've never been cataloged completely. There's just too many. So the Membrack building is named after my late wife, Margaret. And it's called the Margaret Bamberger Research and Education Center. It's an unbelievable thing. It's nobody ever comes there expecting to see something like that on a cattle ranch. But they'll find it here. And there's people here that can give better answers than me. Hell, I forgot most of what I know. But I'm pleased to be associated with what's going here now. And I'll tell you one last thing. My kids do not inherit this ranch. We balled it up. We formed an organization. It's a, it's an institution that will be here forever. My kids don't inherit it. It's a private. It's a 501c3 organization. We support. They support it by gifts and grants, etc. Plus. It's got a lot of my support ahead of time. So they don't have to go out and buy a ranch. They got one, but it does require help to sustain it. And if you want to know more about Bamberger Ranch, you can go to www.bambergerranch.org. Org. That's it. And if you want to know more about my writing, you can go to PamLaBlancAdventures.com. And thank you guys for listening. We really appreciate it. And please pick up a copy of the book. You can learn all of David's stories straight from the horse's mouth. Yes, sir. I got them. All right. Thank you.